well, there's a new one. I've never heard that before. <laughs> <Neither have I. laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of new. Weird. It's new. It's been on for about a week or so. Oh, is it? Oh, well, yeah. that was really weird to hear it. Yeah, it could have been well, a different it's sort of warning. Yeah, I kind of want. Well, it, you've it's been warned. <laughs> yes. Different voice than that. And I can leave the meeting if I want. Oh, but you don't want to do that, don't right? Do that. Yeah. Uh, a pop-up window comes up that uh, I can leave the meeting, possibly oh. if I'm not happy with being recorded. Got oh, it. okay. Well, we should have a some kind of a you're leaving at your own risk. We see you, and uh, <laughs> we're we know who you are. <laughs> it's like subscribing to a. You are being watched. You're being <laughs> yeah. watched. We get you. Don't come back. Okay, are we ready? No. How are we doing? No. No. Not ready. Do you know the way to San Jose? And I don't think that's really what they say. I'm going to get Maybe. it all in your heads. It's already wormed in. Do you know the way to San Jose? Oh, see my mom. Hello, LED. Hello. LED is in the house. Don't forget it. Oh boy. Never. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, why don't we uh, have everybody mute themselves? Okay. And I guess we'll get this show on the road, Kathy. Sounds good. For the show on the Zoom. Are you all ready? Are yes. you are are you all ready? Did you put your lipstick on yet? Uh, I got it on the lower lip. Okay, great. <laughs> That's as good as it's gonna get today. Just go like this, just just a couple times. Okay, great. Looks good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I love you. Love you too. Do you want to want to welcome everybody or do you want me to or you want me to I want you to do the song, honey. Okay, you got the you want to let people in? I am letting them in. All right, great. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to Here we go. Here we go. And we're going to share sound and I'm going to be quiet. And just a moment. One moment. Well, it's the end of the week. Now, where you been? Well, now it's Feedback Friday, so come on in. Come sit down and stare at your screen. We've got a presenter that you never seen. We're Feedback Friday, we're on the loose. We'll be the train, you be the caboose. It's Feedback Friday with Kathy and Amy. Mashed potatoes and the gravy. It's Feedback Friday all day long. Feedback, Feedback, Feedback Friday. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's Feedback Friday on Friday, May 28th. How is everyone? Amy, you're taking over admitting people? Um, yeah, I will do that. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Feedback Friday is our weekly show where we speak with dyers, artists, growers, scholars, mystery writers, crime solvers, all sorts of people about our favorite topic, which is natural dyes and color. Uh, I'm Kathy Hottori, president of Botanical Colors, and joining me is... Oh, wait a minute. I have a new line here. I'm Kathy Hottori, president of Botanical Colors, and I am totally awesome. Well, oh, you right. Wrote that. Follow the script. I caught you. There you got. And joining me is another piece of radical awesomeness, Amy Dufo, director of sustainability and communications. So welcome to our weekly show. We're really delighted today to have Kim Eichler Mesmer join us. Kim is a quilt artist who's been hand dyeing fabric for nearly 20 years. 
And in 2015, she made the decision to switch to natural dyes from using conventional synthetics. And the results have been pretty incredible. Um, she studied with some of the noted uh, practitioners in our field, including Michelle Garcia and Catherine Ellis, and began a journey of learning and discovery that she's still working on really beautiful and amazing works now. Kim will share her work, the learning process and how it influences her and discuss her work, how her work has evolved since making the switch to natural dyes. One of the things I find super fascinating is that Kim is taking the patterns that she makes and having them digitally um, reproduced and then printed on fabric so that you can get this incredible hand printed look uh, on something that's larger than, you know, just a small format that you can use in your own creations. So she, I'm pretty sure she's going to talk a little bit about that and where those particular amazing pieces of fabric, which are so stunning, are available. Um, before I, we start, I want to send out a huge thank you to everyone who joins us for Feedback Friday, and especially for all of your incredible support of getting us through 57 weeks. This is episode 57, 57 weeks of our altered universe. And it was, yeah, 57. Uh oh, Amy's eyebrows are going up. Something's happening. We could not do this without you. So thank you very, very much. Uh, for a little housekeeping, Amy's our moderator and she'll be monitoring the chat. We ask you to mute for the presentation. Uh, after the presentation, we have picture of the week. Week, 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 week. And after picture of the week, we open it up for everyone to say howdy, hi, and all those good things. And uh, the call is being recorded. You were all notified. <laughs> and we'll have a video copy ready for this weekend, along with any additional information resulting from this call. So. After all that info, I just want to turn it over to Kim Eichler-Mesmer. Kim, welcome. Looking forward to hearing your story. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. I have to tell you, I was only like the normal amount of nervous until I saw all of your faces. And then all of a sudden, I got super nervous. <laughs> so um i might talk really really fast so just oh, just yeah just take a breath we're good these are all friends all family no problem <laughs> did you want me to sing again no actually the singing was great though thank you okay i'll do it later for you then. yeah just ask me if you need it okay <laughs> um i'm really honored to be here today i've been watching the series i've been watching the recordings and i can't believe i'm like here in the hot seat sharing my work with this amazing community. So thank you, Kathy and Amy, for inviting me. Um, I am an associate professor in the fiber department at the Kansas City Art Institute, where I've been teaching since 2008. And I primarily teach surface design techniques there, including synthetic and natural dyeing. But I also teach shibori, resists, block printing, screen printing, embroidery. And I also teach a really fun three credit quilting elective every year. Um, like Kathy said at the beginning, I've been dyeing fabric for nearly 20 years, but for the bulk of that I was using synthetic dyes and really only started using natural dyes in about 2015. Um, and I still sort of feel like I'm just scratching the surface of all of the different possibilities. There's so much to learn and so much to explore. But today I'm going to share a little bit about um, why I got into natural dyeing, how the learning process has impacted my work, and where I'm at with it right now. Um, I grew up in Iowa as a total nature kid. Being outside was a really large part of my family life, whether we were camping, um, hiking, or foraging for mushrooms in state parks around Iowa on the weekends, taking big road trips out to the national parks out west in the summer, or growing vegetables in our backyard. We really spent as much time outside as possible. And because of this, I still feel the most comfortable in nature in the woods. And now that I live in Kansas out on the prairie um, and because of this, nature has always been a really large part of my um, artwork, of my studio practice. 
But before I learned about natural dyes, I went to college for engineering and switched in my junior year to fine art and ended up getting a BFA in printmaking. Um, I then went on to get an MFA in textiles from the University of Kansas, which is where I learned how to quilt while studying with Marianne Jordan, who is another amazing um, artist, surface designer, and quilter. Um, my work right before I started using natural dyes was work like this. I was making quilts out of entirely hand dyed fabric using Procyon fiber reactive dyes. And I was really trying to abstract, um, abstract the landscape and evoke sort of the essence of the place or capture the essence of light of a place um, or sort of the memory of a landscape in these pieces. The process of dyeing has always been really fun for me and a fun challenge to be able to push the possibilities of gradation dyeing and try to color match what I see in the world around me and also kind of what I see in my head of the world around me. And I found Procyon dyes really magical because it's so easy to make any color you want with them really quickly. Any color, any value, any amount of fabric, they're fast and easy and they're pretty color fast. Um, and in fact, I, I loved the process of using Procyon dyes in this way so much that I wrote a book um, called Modern Color that's kind of an introductory guide to using Procyon dyes for quilters. And I would spend lots of time just dyeing fabric um, in any color that I could think of, like in this color wheel quilt that has 144 different hand dyed fabrics. Um, and I I was pretty invested in this um, body of work, this line of work. But then in 2013, my dad died from a heart attack and he was pretty young and it was a really big shock. Um, and it might seem like weird and personal to talk about that in a setting like this, but um, his, his passing really affected my whole life, including my studio practice. And it sort of forced me to start um, making better choices, I'll say, both in my life, how I live my life, and in my studio practice. And for a while after he passed, I stopped making artwork kind of all together um, and was just trying to reconnect with myself and with nature, um, trying to just reground myself, spend time outside, doing the things that had made me feel um, good in the past. And Throughout this process, I started thinking about how I live my life, what choices I make, how can I be healthier, both physically and mentally, um, and in turn, how can I live in a way that I have less impact on the earth and the, and the world around me. As part of that sort of reworking and rethinking, I started considering my own art practice and how so much of my work was about the landscape and about nature um, but the things that I was using, the conventional cotton, the synthetic dyes, a lot of other synthetic processes are really not good for the earth. Um, a lot of them are not good for our bodies. Um, and I was also just sort of concerned about the long-term effects that synthetic dyes were going to have on my body. Um, so it slowly started to become clear to me that I needed to change my approach to making artwork. And part of that process was switching from synthetic dyes to natural dyes. My only experience with natural dyes up until this point was like a one, you know, one afternoon workshop that I had while I was getting my BFA, where a local artist came in and shared some of her work and taught us about natural dyes. But everything we made was like beige. Um, and I was not excited. That was in the really early 2000s. So I was not excited about it at that point. So it felt like a huge undertaking, but I still felt like it was kind of the right move for me. Um, but it wasn't until a Surface Design Association conference at Aroma in 2015, where I heard Catherine Ellis speak about her own journey of transitioning from using synthetic dyes to natural dyes, that I really was sort of convinced that I could do it and that I could do it without sacrificing too much in terms of color. I really connected with the way she thought of things and the fact that she was, you know, a dyer, an artist, and an educator. I just felt like um, if she could do it, so could I. And so at her urging, I signed up for a workshop with Michelle Garcia at the Textile Center in Minneapolis 
and was lucky to receive funding from my department um, at the Kansas City Art Institute to go learn and sort of bring back information in the hopes that I would be able to develop some curriculum to start incorporating it into our fiber program. So my goals for the workshop with Michelle, it was a four day workshop, was really just to learn as much as I could about the proper ways to use natural dyes so that I could use them in a responsible way um, to respect you know, the resources and the labor that goes into growing and harvesting the dyes um, so that I could make the healthiest possible choices for me as an individual. Um, and so that I could also create color that was exciting, but that would also be color fast. As an artist who you know, sells my work and shows it in galleries and museums, it's really important for me that the color lasts as much as possible. Um, I fully acknowledge that everything fades and especially in textiles, um, we cannot expect things to last forever, but it's important to me that I, I do things um, in a way that will make them last as long as possible. And luckily, while I was at this workshop, Catherine was having an exhibition at the Textile Center and um, was able to join us for a day of the workshop. So I was able to kind of reconnect with her and talk through how, how do these things that Michelle is teaching translate into an artist studio. He's such a historian and such a scientist that I think the way he thinks about things, while brilliant, is not always super accessible for you know, regular people to do in their home studios. So having sort of the connection between Catherine's process and Michelle's knowledge was, um, I think, a really crucial combination for my learning. After the workshop, I came back to Kansas City and began testing things. And I started the way I think a lot of people start with natural dyes with things that are easily accessible um, that I could either grow or forage around me. So like black walnuts, I was already growing marigold in my garden to keep pests out. Um, there's a lot of goldenrod and sumac around here. Um, and I sort of knew from talking to Catherine and Michelle that these were, not all of these are things that are um, that color fast. They're not all super reliable dyes, but I wanted to see for myself. I wanted to see how they work, see um, what they do on fabric. And then I also wanted to figure out how to do some really simple light fastness testing for myself. So here on the left is just a board that I made with some of the super accessible like onion skin, avocado pits and skins. Um, I have a giant mulberry tree. So testing out, you know, things like that and turmeric. On the right um, are the boards put up in a south facing window of my studio. I left one for I think three weeks and one for like eight weeks to see how fast they would fade over time. And then here's one of the boards. Um, so I learned through doing this why um, it was not going to be feasible for me to use berries and you know food waste items. Um, I teach these when I teach natural dye. I think they're great introductory dyes. They're really fun to play with. Um, but like I said, for me and my own work, they're not things that I, I want to be using because they're not as long lasting. So for me, this hands-on learning was really crucial to understand what they actually do and why I don't want to use them. And I was also experimenting with just every little piece of knowledge I could absorb. I think at this time, it was before Catherine and Joy Boutrip's really amazing book came out. So there was so much information all over the internet and all sorts of different books about all the different ways of treating your fabric, of mordanting it. And it was really hard to know like what was right, what was, um, and maybe not right, that's not the right way to say it, but you know, what would work for me, where I live, what I have access to, and the kind of work that I want to make. So these are all um, matter tests on organic cotton using a variety of different pretreatment processes from like no mordant at all, no pretreating. Um, number two down here, this is a soy milk pretreatment. There's like just tannin, just alum, tannin plus alum, tannin plus aluminum acetate, like all the different combinations I was reading about, I tested and then also exposed to the light. So the circle in the middle is where the sunlight was, was exposed. Um, so through this process, I kind of realized why it's important for me to use a tannin and mordant combination to give really long lasting color. Um, and then which of the processes gave me the best color, both out of the dye bath and long lasting. 
I'm still doing tons of tests as part of my studio practice. As somebody who tends to think a little bit scientifically, this just makes sense for me and is like fun and a way to kind of nerd out. Um, but it also then gives me really good knowledge for my work. And since I already had a pretty big garden, um, I decided that I wanted to see if I could start growing my own natural dyes. And I started with some weld. So this is my weld. Actually, all these photos are from just a couple of days ago when it was sunny here. It's been raining nonstop, but we had a sunny day. So I've been growing my own weld for the past three years. This is my matter bed and it's been also three years. So I'm able to start harvesting that probably pretty soon. And I've also started growing Japanese indigo, woad. This is my woad back here. I need to go cut off all those blossoms before it invades the neighborhood. Um, I also have safflower, dyer's chamomile, coreopsis, um, hopi black sunflowers, just kind of a wide variety of natural dye plants. A lot of them I use as just a learning tool um, in my classes at school and in workshops that I teach and for experiments. Not all of them get used in my work, but I love plants and I love growing things. And so it's really fun for me to feel like I'm a little bit more connected to the dyes that I'm using in my work. Another sort of round of testing that I am pretty engaged in is testing different surface design techniques with natural dye. I teach and love shibori. And I think a lot of people when they're first, you know, maybe learning about indigo do shibori because it's such a fast, easy, fun process that gives really beautiful results. Um, so these are just a, a couple of examples of things that I've done with immersion dyeing in indigo. These two on the left are just white fabric dyed in indigo. The two on the right here are um, indigo discharge. So, you know, dipping fabric multiple times in the indigo to really build up a deep color, applying a shibori resist, and then discharging the color. And these are um, some of the fabrics that I have scanned and had digitally printed like Kathy was talking about at the beginning. And they're actually being manufactured through Paintbrush Studios. Um, I've got a couple examples on my website, but Paintbrush Studios is the place that is manufacturing these for me. Um, machine sewn shibori is one of my all time favorite um, surface design techniques. I learned how to do this from Annalisa Hedstrom. She has an amazing series of DVDs. Um, and I also was able to take a workshop from her in Japan a couple of years ago. And so it made sense to try to incorporate some natural dye into my machine sewn shibori studies and not only using indigo, but trying to create more complex color palettes with mordant dyes. So on the right, that's marigold. Um, with a post mordant of iron. And here on the left is matter with iron. And then on the right are some samples that I did. I'm not happy with them, but I do a lot of samples that I'm not happy with. And that's part of the learning process for me is like trying something, see what happens, try again, see what happens and sort of constantly asking questions and trying to set up um, experiments to answer them. So this was um, weld, matter and indigo. And my mistake here was that I did the indigo last and the alkalinity of the indigo bath damaged the mordant. And so the yellow and red were actually much more vibrant before I put it in the indigo bath. But now, you know, I sort of know that for me, it makes the most sense to start with the indigo, neutralize it, and then do my mordant dyes to really get the most vibrant color possible. So learn, that's how you learn, right? There's no mistakes. Um, in addition to shibori, I love discharging dyes and that was always one of my most favorite things to do with synthetic dyes was use either thiox or jacquard discharge paste. And so when I learned that you could discharge a mordant with a strong acid or an alkali and that lemon juice works, I, my mind was like blown. I was like, I can use lemon juice and not use thiox. This is amazing. Um, so I started doing some studies with different um, combinations of dyes to see how they would discharge. On the left are some of my just initial studies. And then on the right is the quilt that resulted from those studies. So I was really treating my work like a sampling process. And like a lot of, you know, you know, historical quilts, 
um, there's a whole body of quilts that are sampler quilts. So I was sort of thinking of my quilts as samplers of natural dye processes. And this is another example of a screen printed sampler quilt. So um, because my BFA is in printmaking, I've been screen printing as part of my studio practice for really longer than anything else. And screen printing on fabric to me is like the perfect marriage of printmaking and textiles. So for this quilt, I was really trying to explore all of the different possibilities of combining printing with natural dyes. So there are thickened um, mordants, there's thickened alum and iron and different combinations of those two together, um, thickened citric acid, thickened um, extracts. There's some weld and some matter extracts that have been thickened in there and screen printed. And then the blue is a thickened indigo. And I will say like, I did all this to try to be safe -er, but thickened indigo in the way that I'm using it is definitely not safe. It requires a lot of lye and kind of cook the lye with corn dextrin and corn starch. And you really have to wear a respirator and your like goggles and your big, you know, gloves that go up to your shoulders and super duper protect yourself. Um, so it's definitely not a safe process, but it's so magical that I kind of, you know, put on the safety gear once in a while to do this. Because there's two things it does that I find really amazing. Number one, because there's so much lye, it's a really strong alkali and that discharges the mordant. So all these splotches here and the sort of halo effect in this upper left one, that's from the lye in the indigo discharging the mordant. It sort of seeps out into the fabric. Um, and a strong lye will also shrink cellulose fibers. So because these are on an organic cotton, wherever the indigo is applied, it sort of like shrinks up like a shrinky dink, but the background cloth remains, you know, it's regular, um, size, it's regular structure. And so you get this really kind of cool puckering effect from the indigo. But again, not safe. I don't really recommend that you do this at home unless you have a dedicated like dye area that's separate and lots of ventilation and lots of safety gear. So after all this testing, I was like, okay, I think I'm ready to go back to my quote unquote real work. And in my brain, I was telling myself this story that my real work was those like sort of abstracted landscape quilts. And I felt like I was finally at a point after a couple of years of just practicing and, and learning and making lots of colors that I could try to make that work again. And I re realized really fast that I, I just couldn't kind of for two reasons. I wasn't interested in that work anymore. It had been long enough that I was way more excited about all the experiments that I was doing and all the, the new processes I was learning. Um, but I also kind of realized that I can't make any color that I want with natural dye. Like that's kind of not the point of natural dye. And where with Procyon, I was so used to just controlling it and really making any color that I wanted and imposing my will over the fabric. With natural dye, it was much more about letting the dyes kind of just do what they do and, you know, guiding them and nudging them, but also letting them sort of guide me and discovering like what the possibilities were rather than forcing them. So I made these two and then kind of just said, okay, that's it, I, I tried. Um, I'm gonna keep doing these quilts that ask questions and answer questions and try to embrace the possibilities of natural dye, how they work with different dye processes, how they look on different kinds of fabric um, and still sort of thinking about the landscape, but in different ways. So these two are both inspired by um, central pivot irrigation, which is a type of um, irrigation that you see frequently in like the Western states and sort of the Western prairie states um, where a sprinkler goes around from a central point and it creates these amazing like crop circles when you see them from the sky. And because I was, you know, trying to really embrace now the potential of the color and just the beautiful things that were happening in the dye pot. Um, it opened me up to using other kinds of fabrics. Before natural dye, I was really sort of proud of saying every color you see, every mark you see, every pattern is me. I put that into the fabric. Um, but now I'm much more open to using beautiful fabrics that I have from my stash. Um, or like, for example, the black and white stripe in here, and there's the same one over here that's over dyed with indigo. Um, 
those are from a fabric line that I designed for Marcus Fabrics. But I'm starting to incorporate things like linen, silk, wool, hemp, in addition to trying to use up the bolts of cotton that I have left over from the before times. Um, and this sort of mode of working where I'm asking questions, setting up experiments to try to answer them, and then making quilts as a result has also led me to using that machine sewn shibori technique to create larger quilts rather than just small studies, which is kind of all I had done with it before. So this quilt, this is a detail here on the right. Um, it's a nine patch quilt. So each of the nine pieces of fabric is about 20 inches square and they're all folded um, in the same way and then machine sewn and dyed in a couple of different dye baths. This one has indigo, black walnut, and then a um, after bath of iron. So because each one is started in the same way, they have a nice sort of synergy and symmetry, but also because I'm sort of treating each one as its own special bundle, they also are all special in their own way. So to me, that's also part of the magic is trying to, you know, exert some control over the process, but then also being open to the magic of the process. This is another example. It's the exact same sort of idea. It's a nine patch quilt, um, 20 inch squares, all folded into a nice tight little bundle and machine sewn and then dyed in matter. And again, I think in this one, you can really see what to me is the magic of natural dyes. These bundles were all put in the same mordant baths. They were all in the same dye bath, but because each one is in a different part of the mordant bath or a different part of the dye pot, they absorb the dye a little bit differently. And so you get some that are much more orange, like this upper left one is really orange. This one down here, for some reason, really got, you know, super vibrantly red. Um, so that variation that comes out of one dye bath, I think, is just really beautiful. Um, yeah. And those quilts came before this one. And one of the things that I love about the machine sewn shibori process is that it looks like other things. It can look like x-rays or like photograms. And there's just a really wonderful sense of like light emanating out of them. So with this quilt, I really wanted to try to push that through layering different um, types of machine sewn shibori and different dye baths to try to get things that feel like they're sort of coming up to the surface or you know being being submerged or emerging out of the fabric. So again, it's the same sort of idea. It's a nine patch um, where each one was sort of stitched and dyed separately in a variety of different dye baths. This one has matter, kutch, black walnut, indigo, and also some iron. And here in the detail, you can see how I'm sort of quilting it. In my work before natural dye, I thought of the quilting process as like a drawing or another layer of information on top of the quilt. Whereas now that I'm feeling much more open and it's like a conversation with the dyes, I don't decide the quilting until after the quilt top is finished. And I sort of quilt in response to the things that are coming out of the fabric. This is a, the result of another sort of question. Um, the largest piece of machine sewn shibori I had made until this point was like a fat quarter. So about 18 by, you know, 24 ish. But I wanted to see if I could do it on a full yard and still get the um, like the sort of nuance and the detail and the sense of light and dark from it. So this is just a detail shot of a, a one yard piece of fabric where I was really trying to scale up but also at the same time create a rich black. And I think, you know, those of you that have tried to create a black with natural dye know that it's not the easiest thing to do. It takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. Um, but I think when you finally get it, it's like so exciting and so satisfying. Um, and there's not one right way to do it. So that was another exciting sort of challenge for me was figuring out how do you make black? How can I make a black um, that is the kind of black that I wanna see on my fabric? And you can probably imagine because um, I do so much testing and so much sampling and I do teach a lot. I teach this at KCAI and I teach a lot of workshops. 
I end up with a lot of um, scraps and a lot of samples and tests and swatches and things that aren't necessarily destined to become artwork. So in, in another effort to be um, sort of more mindful of my waste, I'm not gonna say that I'm zero waste because I'm just, I'm not, that's not how my brain wakes, not, not how my brain works. But in an effort to use as much as my, of my material as possible, I have been piecing all of my scraps together to create sort of custom yardage. And on the left is a detail of some of the yardage that I did. I kind of gather everything by color family, um, piece it together using my serger, because again, I'm using lots of different fabrics in here. There's like some silk habitat, there's linen, there's wool gauze. I use some raw silk. Um, I don't even know what else is in there. There's some linen and or some velvet in some of these. So I piece all these sort of various scraps of dye tests together and then cut them apart to use as my own like sort of custom patchwork fabric in my quilts. And this is another kind of body of work that I'm exploring at the same time that I'm doing those machine sewn shibori pieces. One feels very controlled and very much like it's coming straight out of my brain. Whereas this body of work is much more um, a loose kind of response to the fabric that I have. Um, I can't sort of deny the influence of the G's Bend quilts. I think, you know, any contemporary quilter is just indebted to those quilts. Um, so this sort of allows me to feel like a connection to um, the idea of using what I have and trying to make something beautiful out of essentially what to me would be waste otherwise. And here's another example from my sort of green yellow family of swatches. So the fabric on the left that I've pieced together and then how I've cut it apart on the right to use in this quilt. And this is where I'm still going. So these are the two kind of most recent quilts that I've made. This one on the right is not finished. It's just a quilt top. Um, but these also came out of that desire to use, like, I'm going to say ugly, they're not really ugly fabrics, but they're things that didn't come out right, or I just wasn't excited about them. So all of the dark fabric in the backgrounds of these have been over dyed with indigo, black walnut, and iron to try to darken them and deepen them and create sort of a background for these other um, strips and scraps of fabric to emerge out of, in kind of the same way I was thinking about the machine sewn shibori but with a really different um, kind of process and outcome. And then, I mean, we all know that the pandemic happened and my studio practice hit a major um, pause button. When that happened, I went from teaching wonderful, amazing students in person in beautiful facilities to having to take everything online. And when you teach a six credit in-person textile studio class and you have to do it online, that's really challenging. So I had to rework my entire curriculum, which basically meant I, I haven't had time to do any studio work for the past year. Um, but this sort of new awareness of using what I have and playing with my scraps, I think could not have been a better timing for me because these are sort of what I'm working on now. I'm using my scraps and I'm making very small hand-stitched raw edge collages as a way to sort of keep my hands working, keep touching fabric, keep stitching, um, but in something that is very low pressure and does not take a lot of brain power that I can easily pick up and put down in sort of my spare moments. Um, and then I'll just end here. This is a flag that is indigo dyed that I made for a, a giant campus-wide project we had at school in the fall semester. And it's become sort of a mantra to me over the past year, past few months, both in my studio practice and in my life. So thank you all so much for listening and for being here. I'm looking forward to your questions and please feel free to ask me anything. Great, Kim, thank you so much. I just love the idea that you, you have both random and control, you know, and you've balanced it so, beautifully in your pieces it's that's really inspirational thank you very very much thank you it yeah. often feels kind of disjointed um no it's very coherent you know I was kind of just looking at each piece and 
and seeing that, you know, you have a real deliberate placement of everything, even though the, the base may be, you know, the, the nuance of the dye bath that you didn't quite get what you wanted, but you were still able to incorporate it in a really wonderful way to state all of that. I was, I was very, very um, enthralled with this beautiful work. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Amy. You got lots of questions. Yeah. Um, and we also have picture of the week. So let's go. <laughs> Rushing things. Sir. Thanks, Kim. That was that was awesome. Okay, jumping in. Uh, beautiful work. I'm in love. Uh, what is sewing machine Shibori? Oh, sewing machine Shibori is like a combination of hand-sewn Shibori and like fold and clamp. So you essentially fold a piece of fabric up um, like a fold and clamp shibori or like origami. And then you sew it with a sewing machine and the stitches create the compression that resists the dye. So you put it in the dye bath and then when you pull out, rip out all the stitching wherever you've sewn, you get the, you know, sort of ground cloth color. And you don't have to, you know, pull the threads like you do with hand sewn shibori because there's so much compression between the sewing machine stitches and the folds of the fabric that it sort of magically does it for you. That is next level because I always thought you had to hand hand do it, but nope. that's all right, great. It's super fun. That wasn't my question, but that's a good question. Okay, for machine sewing, can you talk a bit about needles, thread and machine that you use? And also there's free hand quilting is at the end of that. Oh, okay. Um, I am the worst person to ask about needles because I think I always just use like an all purpose needle. Um, I have a little manual Bernina, it's like a Bernina Activa. Um, the thread is the important part of machine sewn shibori and it's important that you use a rayon thread either in your bobbin or in the top thread and then like a cotton or polyester, whatever you normally use for piecing in the other place. And that's because the rayon thread is really weak when it's wet. So as soon as you can pull your bundle out of the dye bath, you can find the thread that's either cotton or poly, the one that's not rayon and just like yank on it. And the rayon thread just like breaks so that you can really easily untie your bundle without having to seam rip. So that's like the pro tip, rayon in your bobbin. If you don't do that, you're gonna to have to seam rip the whole thing and it is not fun and you're probably gonna get a hole in your fabric. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what was the name of the woman who you learned machine so, so it's like a tongue twist, miss machine sewn shibori from? Her name is Anna Lisa Hedstrom. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. She is fantastic. She makes beautiful work. Um, and has this, a really amazing series of DVDs. She's also doing a series on Shibori with Yoshiko Wada. Um, I think they've done four or five or six episodes that are really great. Wow. Okay, wonderful approach, knowledge and information. What do you thicken dye with? Um, you can use guar gum. I think guar gum is usually what I use. Kathy's nodding yes too. Yeah. Uh, let's see, what is your most successful way to obtain black on cotton? The way that I've been doing it is I try to get as deep of a shade of indigo as possible first. I always start with a dark indigo. And then I've been doing a combination of gallnut tannin and iron um, and oxidation. So I'll soak in gallnut tannin and then I'll soak in a weak iron solution and then I'll just let it oxidize for a few hours or a day. And then I'll keep repeating that process over the course of a few days. But I find that the oxidation, that waiting time really helps get a nice deep color. But I also only do that on cellulose. I don't know that that would be a great approach if you're using silk, definitely not for wool. Um, and even on silk, I think that much iron and indigo, the alkalinity and the iron combined could really damage the silk. So only use those on like linen or hemp or cotton. Kathy's nodding yes on that as well. 
backing you up. Okay, what do you mean by discharging the dye? So discharging is when you like detach the dye from the fabric. So it's like bleaching. Bleach is a discharge process. But with natural dye, you can detach the mordant from the fabric. Um, so a strong acid like lemon juice will chemically unbind the mordant from the fabric. And so once the mordant is taken out, the dye goes out with it. I like how like quick your answers are. This is great. We're just like going. I know. It's like my teacher brain is on like pop, 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 next. <laughs> yeah, You're awesome. Okay, what is the combination of natural dyes that, okay, sorry, that give her the black she's happy with? You, you were just talking about that. Okay. What process do you use to neutralize after indigo? Um, I, this is a big bummer of a question for me because I've been, experiencing a lot of fading with my indigo kind of no matter what I do. So that's one of my summer break goals is figure out a better process. But what I normally do is I'll let my indigo oxidize for a few days and then I'll let it soak in cold water for a few days. Um, and I'll like sort of come through every day or so and change out the cold water until it's clear. Like the first few days, it looks sort of yellowy or just a little bit scummy. But once it's clear, then I'll take the fiber out and put it in a vinegar bath, like vinegar and cold water mixed together. And for now, that's all I do. I'll finish with just a hand wash um, with, you know, I use just like blue Dawn um, dish soap to wash my fabric with. But I know a lot of dyers really recommend boiling their indigo dyed cloth. Um, I don't know, I, I just don't like doing that because of, it just seems like it washes out so much. I don't know, and whenever I do that, the color kind of changes. So I'm definitely not an indigo expert. I do it a lot, but I feel like I still have so many questions about the right way to finish things. Kathy, did you want to add anything to that at all? You want me to keep going? Probably keep going, but okay. Kim, I can probably chat later. Okay, cool. I have some, I have some ideas. Okay. Got a couple ideas. All right. Any specific tricks for dyeing velvet to get a more uniform color versus having the, the nap impact the dyeing process? Um, I don't think I've ever had the nap really impact it too much. Um, but I've only really been doing like an immersion dye bath with velvet. Um, I also am never very concerned with getting a completely even color on my naturally dyed fabrics. I like the nuance and the variation that happens. I'm also sort of a lazy stirrer. Um, so maybe instead of trying to force it, just let the velvet be the velvet and find beauty in the <laughs> nuance. Let the velvet be the velvet. Okay. <laughs> There's two people asking about citric acid discharges. Um, is there a resource for a recipe? And, or, and can you talk a little bit more about discharging with lemon or citric yeah. acid? Yeah, I like all of my best recipes are from the Catherine Ellis Joy Boutrop Art and Science of Natural Dye Book. The thickeners in there, um, discharging processes are in there. The, even the indigo, printing with indigo is in that book. So if you want like really specific information, I would get their book. It's amazing. But like the gist is you thicken it with guar, you make a guar gum paste, add your citric acid or your lemon juice, apply it. Um, you have to like chalk it at the end. There's a whole process, but you can read about it. I'll put the, I mean, we've, we've got the book on our site too, that Catherine Ellis's book. So I, I'll put it in there after this. Um, let's see, it, is there a good book on Stitch Shibori that you? No, I, I don't think I've ever seen it in a book it might be in Yoshiko Wada's Shibori book there might be it is collection. yeah yeah Katano Shibori also yeah. a lot of Shibori books from Japan will show Katano which is the stitch machine stitched um, Shibori 
I'm just trying to think, but I don't, I don't think there's much more than a chapter or a sub chapter on it. Right. It's, it's pretty modern, you know, and Japan's pretty traditional. So mm -hmm. it's a, but it's a beautiful effect. Yeah. So let's see, Margarita is saying that she loves your work. Do you still run online classes? What's the best place to follow your work? Your website, thank you. I'll have all this stuff in, on, up by Sunday in the video post, but I uh, have, I put Kim's website in the chat, but it's, if I mess around with things, I'm gonna lose this chat here, but I'll put, you'll, we'll have it all there. And if, if somebody wants to plop it in the chat right now, Kim's or Kim or Kathy, Kim's, um, website that'd be great i'll put it in there and i'm also on instagram i'll put that in the yeah. chat are you in the new studio that you built i watched the progress on your instagram if yes. so what full space yes this is my studio it was finished right before the pandemic so i was so happy that i had a space to teach from while we were online and it's amazing and i have a little clay corner over there i just started doing clay in november <laughs> and got totally addicted that yeah. takes care of, like the next question about uh, i see a potter's wheel what is your clay practice yeah my clay practice is playing and learning and having fun and making lots of mugs and planters <laughs> So are the, are the mugs any like pottery on your site at all or is because I was looking I know you have bundles of fabric and no I am not good enough yet to sell them right now they're only gifts for family and friends someday I might sell them but that feels like so much pressure you know it's kind of for me right now it's my hobby <laughs> yeah there's so many people asking about lemon and lemons in the discharge you've, you've talked about it quite a bit okay what type of indigo vat do you use Oh, I have, I usually have two going. I have um, Michelle Garcia's one, two, three vat. Um, and I usually use henna to get it started and then feed it with fructose. And I also have an iron vat. Um, and I use for that Graham Keegan's recipe. Um, he has great indigo information on his website. And I also last summer started experimenting with like a real fermented vat. So I have a little tiny vat of fermented indigo that I am just using for samples right now, but I'm hoping to be able to make a bigger version to start using in my work this summer. Okay. Very specific question here. When you made the nine patch quilt, did you cut the squares to size then die? Um, <laughs> I think I, no, I think I cut them a little bit bigger than I wanted them to be. And then sewed them and dyed them and then trimmed them to be square. So I probably started with like a 22-ish inch piece of fabric. There. I probably seem like I'm really neat and tidy, but I am a really messy, really messy worker. So I, I never really start out very cleanly. Things kind of get cleaned up at the end. Yep. Let's see. Um, you've got everybody's juices going. Their creativity's flowing. I'm just summing, summing up all these beautiful comments from everybody here. So um, I like this from Julia Rose. I was chagrined to hear you say you needed to get back to your real work after all the experimenting, experimenting. I think that's a funny boundary distinction a lot of us make when really all that we make is real work, which is yeah, true. It's so true. That's something that I feel like I'm talking to my students about all the time as young artists they think that they have to make a certain kind of work or that something is expected out of them. But like the things that they naturally do often are way more interesting than what they're like trying to do, like the real work they're trying to do. And I, I have that same issue even after, you know, teaching for so long and making art for so long that I feel like I have these lies in my head that I tell myself about what kind of artist I should be or what my work should be instead of just trying to like embrace it and like let my work be what it is and and know that that is that's what it is and that's that's good enough not only is it not good enough but like that's great do it absolutely absolutely 
quote up today on Instagram and Facebook on a, a lot of people experimenting with kind of rainbows and stuff, but it was a really good quote that you have to go to our Instagram or Facebook page to read it, but it talks about what you're, what we're, what we're saying here about the process of making and experimenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. Kim, thank you so, so much. This was just, what a treat. Thank what you. What a treat. It was, yeah, it was a really great way to end this week. Thank that's you very, very much. Um, we hope to be in constant communication now that we, are like seeing all the beautiful work you're doing. We'd love to, to hear and experience more. I am now gonna turn it over. Oh, wait, I have some re, uh, reminders. Um, okay, books are on sale until Sunday. Sunday. Mm, Monday. We do have Catherine Ellis's book in stock. Uh, what else? Yeah, lots of great books. Make Thrift Men by Katrina Rodebaugh. Got lots of those, that's a great book. Um, we just started our summer series with Abu Bakar Fofana and we're in the middle of our five day stitched uh, resist workshop, which is super interesting, but he's also doing mineral mud. He's also doing a three day indigo and he's doing a tunic um, construction workshop. So any interest in those, please sign up. We have payment plans. We also have scholarships. People have been super generous in donating to our scholarship program. Thank you. So we're able now to turn that around and offer it to um, folks to participate. And um, we have, oh, I'm teaching a class. I'm teaching a class in August on color gradations. And it's not just a single color moving to um, lighter and lighter or darker and darker. It's actually combining two colors. And I saw that Joyce Hayes joined us. Um, the pictures that are on the site were work that Joyce did when we were working together in our studio. And uh, they're just extraordinary for tapestry weaving, but we're going to do the same thing on fabric. So if you have any interest in this, it's a way to look at two dyes that you probably would never combine and see what you get out of it. And it's always surprising and always beautiful. So join us for that. That's in August in Seattle. Um, all the details are on the site. Next week, uh, we're talking with artist and natural dyer and educator Christy Johnson. This is really exciting. I can't wait to, to watch this. Her mission as both an artist and a teacher is to break through the lies we tell ourselves about our own creative capabilities so we can better access our abilities to transform. Okay, how apropos is that, right? Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. So be there. She teaches embroidery and textile arts for visionaries who want to transform their dreams into textural designs on fabric. Oh my God, I need a workshop with this. <laughs> <laughs> I so need it. <laughs> ah! Okay, great. I am now going to turn it over to Amy in the last couple minutes um, for our picture of the week. Week, week, week. And I'm so happy that I've been feverishly texting and looking for Rosa Chang but I know Rosa's here now. So Rosa, can you unmute yourself? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> here. Where is Rosa? Okay, I'm gonna spotlight you. There you are. Hi. <laughs> I love that your hands are all. <laughs> I'm on some experiment these days, so. Yeah. Thank you Rosa, for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, Rosa is also was one of our first um, first feed one of the first round like very early feedback Fridays that we did with the Indigo Shade Map and the Maryland Institute College of Art. So, anyways, nice to see you again here. All right, now I'm going to share the screen so you can talk all about the picture of the week, which was this. Oh, beautiful. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful image. So why don't you, I, I thought it was so interesting. Just the colors came out beautiful, but then what you did with the matter root as well. So can you talk about it? Oh, sure. Uh, so I've been interested in um, researching for new type of um, indigo vet process with more like traditional fermentation way. And so before that, I used to work as an apprentice under the indigo Japanese indigo dyer for like a sukumo process that was my really old background and I was kind of like looking for a similar way to do making the vat 
and then found a recipe about the marrow root fermentation in Digova. So um, I just really wanted to try that. That's how I purchased the marrow root. And then, and then learned that I can just to use that exhausted marrow root after dyeing that fabric with the beautiful red color. So, so I, 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 this is so precious dye. So I just wanted to dye um, marrow root dye first before making the indigo vat. And so I dyed um, some wool yarns for my friends. So I just play with the mordant that, um, yeah. So the light color one, I didn't use the mordant and, and then I just play with different time and different like uh, use of more than to make the color different. So yeah. And then after that, I made that indigo vat, it took whole like six days and then all oh, six days, the color came up very beautifully. And now it made my hand blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions about how you actually did that and how many matter roots and how much of how much of each what you used to make the, the vat itself. Do you have yeah. any numbers? So, at all? Actually, so actually that recipe is also included in the one of the book at the botanical color that the art and craft of natural dyeing by J.N. Lyles. Am I pronouncing right? Yeah. Is that right, Kathy? Uh, Jim Lyles. Jim Lyles, yes. Yeah. yeah. So Great book. that book also include the matter root recipe. So I think you guys can check that out. And also Cheryl Colender from Aurora Silk used to have a matter root recipe indigo fermentation yeah, um, I as found well on her site yes. too. Yes, I saw that as well, yeah. So, all right, thanks Rosa. And I just, there's so many, I'm trying to get to the main page here. How do I get out of here in this? So follow Rosa. <laughs> A lot of great work. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. We're also getting, we've gotten, I don't even know if we still have indigo seeds, Kathy. We have a few left of um, the project that Rosa and Kenya Miles worked on called Blue Light Junction. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the, um, we have Persicara tinctoria, which also called Japanese indigo. Um, we still have some of those seeds, just a few left. And we have a few of the Indigo Ferra Sufructicosa, which is Madame Magar. So if you want them, get them. Yeah. And also follow Rosa with the Indigo Shade Map, that Indigo Shade Map. So obviously there's a couple things going on here. Yeah. <laughs> Rosa does all sorts of amazing things. All right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Rosa. Thank, Thank you so much. On the fly like that. Okay, guys, we are going to say goodbye. Thank you. You can unmute. Kathy, um, what do you think we should do sometime is get like the sound of music? Be like. Maybe that's. What, what are we singing? The theme song or one of the. Uh... Oh, no. No, we're not going to sing the theme song. Oh, climb every mountain. <laughs> oh, no. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very Amy, much. Stick thank around you so if you want to be in the after party. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 I He's thought I saw Brees too. Yeah. He was oh, here. But, um, apparently, oh, Helen. Hi, Helen. She has a meeting. Hi, Dorothy. Oh, Hi. <laughs> yeah. So, <Thank> Kim. <laughs> Let me. Um. So, you're. What kind of fading are you getting? Um. Well, I've had it fade both like on a wall, but also I have indigo folded in a tub that doesn't see any light. It's like in a dark room with no uh -huh. windows. And it fades along the the, the fold line. Ooh. Is that fructose fat or uh, um? Um, I have mostly it's a fructose fat, but I have a piece that I dyed when I was in Japan, um, at Hiroyuki Shindo's studio, and mm -hmm. I he was using 
I don't know what kind of vat it was, I guess. His normal vat. And it Does he use skumo? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a fermentation vat. Yeah, it's fermented. Fermentation vat shouldn't fade that much. Typically, it's it's because of all the excess alkali that's on the fabric. Yeah. It starts to, it seems to impact it. So I always do a pretty vigorous wash immediately. Do you boil but, it or do you just wash it? I don't hand? boil it, but we also, um, we put vinegar in the, like the first wash or the second wash. You know, we get most of the blue out and then we immediately soak it. Because okay. if you're using calcium hydroxide, it just seems to really, it seems so aggressive on, you know, like you would think that sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide would be even more aggressive against the fabric, but I've never seen the type of fading that I see in the one, two, three vats that I've never seen that on, you know, the ones where I'm using um, lye or potassium hydroxide. Just So there's something with the, cal the calcium hydroxide, okay. I think. That's my hunch, but trying to get all that alkali out of uh, all that powdery stuff out of there immediately yeah. seems to help okay. a little bit, but okay. it's pretty vigorous. I mean, wash it that soon yeah in a washing machine do you can you just like throw it in a do you have a studio washer no i only have my regular washer yeah if you can like pick up a cheap top loader okay. off of craigslist or a used appliance place and just install that and you that agitation will okay. help get that stuff out okay and you wash with hot water when you do that no not necessarily just agitate a lot of water. Lukewarm, kind of okay. really trying to get that stuff out. I mean, I learned the hard way with um, a wool. No, it was, it was a cashmere um, shawl. <laughs> and it was so loaded with calcium hydroxide. If I shook it, it would just puff out oh calcium gosh. hydroxide. Ugh. And then it started fading. It was just a mess. And I couldn't agitate it very much. Yeah. So that, that was kind of disappointing. Okay. That's All right. Good information though. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Yeah. That was incredible. All right. I, I'm going to run. I, Amy, I'm making you I host. Have, I have to tell you something. Yes, ma'am. Can't say who it is. Yes. But some of the things you look really beautiful today. I do. Yeah. If you just knew, you just knew what happened. <laughs> We'll say All, who right. It is. All right. Uh, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely. Um, red? I am. I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> but now, um, now I'm going. Nine years. Oh, right. Okay. All right. All Kim, right. are you still? Is Kim still there? I'm still here, but I'm gonna leave in a minute. Kim's I'm wondering. Um, yeah, is uh, I'm trying to think of your. I studied also with uh, Marianne Jordan. Is she still where you are? Is she still at um, KCO? She's at the University of Kansas. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I, same place, but she came out to Haystack one year, and it was she was wonderful. Yeah, she um, is amazing. She's really a great person. But I was I was really blown away by your work um, as a quilter, as somebody who does more, um, I'm trying to make pieces about environmental issues and I'm doing a lot of cyanotype, but I've just, and I'm just a beginner, rank beginner with the other process and trying to wean myself out of the uh, Prochan dyes. So this was really inspiring, thank you. Thank you, cyanotypes are fun too. Oh yeah, yeah, I managed to do some cyanotype that I thought was gonna look like ocean litter and microplastic, but they came out looking like plants and I was using garden tools and all sorts of stuff, but it's really fun. Nice. Hi, Barbara. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. You look, uh, you look absolutely beautiful today. We shouldn't leave you out. <laughs> yeah, we should. Oh. Hey, Barbara. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start blushing. Blushing. Don't even try. I'll start blushing. No, yeah. I won't. You can't tell when I blush. I just get sweaty palms suddenly. But yeah. You so that's good. Pretty good. Yeah. Maybe a little... Um, TM either, but uh, yeah. But... <laughs> no, no such thing. I'm going to uh, dip out.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Thank you. That was great, Kim. And great great Thank you, Kim. Kim. It was awesome. Take a class with Kim. She's got yes. so much going on on her website, so definitely go there and go go check it out. Oh my God, we're still recording. What in God's name? <laughs> what?